All righty. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to be giving a slightly modified version of a talk that I've been kind of giving on and off for the past couple of years. Uh, basically, it's on this product we developed called the Information Security Practice Principles, which we have nice little A5 cards up here at the front. If you're interested, you can pick one up. And uh, I'll get a little bit into the motivation behind why we started this, but basically, we wanted to make the first principles for security, and we realized it didn't really exist yet. So uh, we set out to make one. And just a little more background about me. Uh, my background is in law. You know, I went to law school. Uh, I'm not an in the weeds technical kind of person. And so uh, this, uh, this talk is uh, definitely geared to be approachable for just about anyone. So if I say some stuff and you don't know what I'm talking about, just you know, throw your fork at me or something. And, uh, and I'll stop and I'll, and I'll try to elaborate. But most of the stuff, we designed it for I call it you know, the, my mom test, where it's, if it's something I can explain to my mom, then that's the level we're trying to work at. All right, so a quick roadmap of uh, what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, I'm starting with some big picture thoughts on cybersecurity. Uh, this is kind of setting the stage. I mean, I guess, just a show of hands, how many people here would say majority of your job is cybersecurity focused? Okay, a good number. Uh, how many people are just like IT generally, maybe? Okay, and, and how many people are just like gen pop, you know, no, no background? Or maybe students, I guess. All right, so we, we got a pretty good mix. So uh, I'm gonna give you some big picture thoughts about cybersecurity. Uh, then I'm gonna walk through the principles uh, using some hopefully fun examples. Uh, leaving some time for a Q&A at the end. And uh, then I've, I've got this section on here, time permitting, where I can walk through some more in-depth hypotheticals where we kind of use all the principles in tandem, but we probably won't have time for that because I. I can be long-winded. Okay, and goals for this talk. Uh, first and foremost is I just want people to be able to think critically about cybersecurity. And the point here is not to make everyone an expert immediately, but it's to give you the basic tool set so that when you're confronted with a cybersecurity problem or challenge, that you have a framework to start with, right? You're not just going in blind. You say, okay, I know at least what to start, and that way when I identify problems, I'll kind of know what to do with them. Uh, also, of course, I want you to understand the principles because that's technically what the talk's about. And just not be too boring, so uh, hence uh, Mario. Okay, so uh, doing some background. First, this is like a standard lawyer thing, is whenever we talk about anything, the first thing we do is complain about definitions. We, you know, it's like, well, we're gonna talk about cybersecurity. They'll be like, well, what is cybersecurity? And it's surprisingly contentious. This is something you would think would be more settled. But um, one thing, just names are like really weird in this space. So when I had to do research for this project, I was like, you know, first things first, let's see what all the good people, you know, what all the smart people say about this field. And I found out that there's like eight different ways you can call this field. You know, there's cybersecurity, one word, two word hyphen. Uh, information security, IT security, computer security. There's a whole assurance world, which is pretty closely related. There's the hyphenation question, how many words? It's, it's a mess. And uh, things we do know are you know, blue padlocks somehow involved. They're the most common uh, thing throughout all of cybersecurity. And uh, the point is, I'm actually not gonna answer this question. I'm just gonna kinda highlight it as it's a tricky space because most of what we're doing is trying to assure what we call the mission. You know, basically, you've got some kind of goal, the thing you care about, and you want security to help secure it. And uh, we tend to be pretty broad in how we think about cybersecurity because if there is a gap somewhere that you say, you know, I define cybersecurity as it's only information systems or something like that, and then we have a vulnerability that undermines it that is outside of that, you know, our mission still fails. So we're always thinking about these things in kind of a big picture terms. And then maybe, you know, as you get more into the field, you can narrow it more. Okay, and then this is my, my jokey slide of what cybersecurity is to a cybersecurity practitioner. It's, we got some compliance crosswalk tables, we've got control lists, uh, the money is in a clamp because you can't get it. Um, putting out fires, there's some sort of like swirly arrow diagram, it's always in a circle, there are a lot of those. And uh, alcohol. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just to give you some framing about how my spe you know, the specific thing of the principles fits in to a more holistic decision-making model, I think about everything in terms of decision-making. 
because maybe this is like the video game approach, but it's like you're a character, you got a place, you're like, do I go left, do I go right, what do I do? You gotta make a decision, right? We're not thinking in the abstract, we're being pretty practical, we're being pretty applied. And so I just made up this very simplistic hierarchy, hierarchy of kind of how do you, you know, manage decision making. And this is, I'm skipping some stuff, engineers will talk about problem definition and whatnot. But my basic three tiered system is, well first things first, is there already an answer? Because if there's already an answer, I don't need to figure it out for myself, don't reinvent the wheel. It's like just find the WikiHow article, it's fine. Uh, it turns out, well I mean so yeah, and you get those from like panels of experts who all agree on something, maybe there's like years of practice or something like that. In my experience, there's not as much of this as you would like. Sometimes we pretend like things are solved when they're not, and in a lot of cases, we have very easy cases that are solved and everyone else is harder than that easy case. So when there aren't well-established answers, the next step is, what does the evidence say? Is there any evidence? Because you know, maybe you know, people did some research and they said, you know, this is the way to make strong passwords. Well, well let's go with that. Maybe it's not this well-established evidence, but there's something. Turns out there's not a whole lot of that either. Uh, I mean, security research is, uh, it's challenging to begin with because everyone's so specialized, and uh, a lot of it is just kind of difficult to decipher. So that's when we get down to the third thing, all right? So there isn't a clear answer. We don't really have evidence to go off of, so we turn to first principles. So when you've got nothing else, this is what you can fall back on. And so that's what this talk is really focused on. I'm not trying to say we're gonna solve all your problems with this one thing, but it's saying that if you have nothing else, you can always turn back to the principles and they'll give you something. They'll give you that basic framework to walk through. So yeah, we're gonna focus on this final step. And uh, the other key thing about the principles, in addition to decision making, is uh, communicating. Which is basically, sometimes you actually know the right answer, right? You're a smart person or someone else on your team is a smart person. And you say, I know what to do but I don't have the power to make it happen, I need to get someone else to act. And normally the person who you need to get to act, uh, you know, they're, they're your boss, it's leadership, they're probably not a cybersecurity person, they probably don't speak the lingo, and uh, you need to convey to them in a clear way why cybersecurity is important to them. And if you go in there and you start talking about control sets and lists, you know, unless they're, you know, they've got like a good compliance focus, their eyes are gonna glaze over, they're not really gonna understand. And so the idea here is that you can uh, you know, explain problems in terms of fundamentals. These are very core things that everyone can kind of intuitively get. And uh, that way you can then frame them in terms of their mission. So basically you've got something you care about, here's how security will enable that. Uh, yeah, we get a, a nice OED definition of principle. Uh, and just some nice things about principles. So this is something I've thought a lot about, but I'm gonna kinda glaze over, you know, what exactly is a principle? Because it's a term people like to throw around a lot, and it can be a little loosey-goosey. Uh, but the reason why we like principles, as we've defined them, is they apply everywhere and to everything, right? They're universal. Uh, they're timeless, you know, they never change. So we cite like Sun Tzu in our, we've got a white paper that we wrote, pointing back, you know, these are not new concepts. We're basically just saying, you know, we're consolidating a whole lot of knowledge that's out there already. Uh, you can use them to derive more specific practices. So if you find like a very specific security thing, you can talk about it in terms of first principles. And there's only seven. I mean, that's nice, right? You know, people don't want to have to, you know, it's the five plus or minus two rule. If it gets too long, people can't remember them. And the final point here is that these are really the whys of security. So when you talk about security, you say, this is the reason why I'm doing X. Okay, and now for the fun stuff. So um, normally I just give this talk and I just you know, use like historical examples or military examples or something you know, boring and more academic-y. And uh, Kay, who had proposed that I give this talk, said well maybe you know, throw in something fun. And I was like, all right, video games, because I know a lot about video games. So I figured, all right, just Mario. Everyone knows Mario. Uh, and then I immediately realized the problems with choosing Mario. So one is uh, Mario is not the most security focused. It's really Bowser, the bad guy who has the security problems. Uh, so we're gonna be taking Bowser's side in this. I hope you all don't mind. And the other disclaimer is that uh, Super Mario Bros was really hard and I was really young when this game came out. This is Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. And I switched to the PlayStation in the mid 90s and kind of never looked back. 
So I'm not even that big of an expert on Mario. So if there are any Mario experts in the room, just feel, feel free to raise your hand and tell me why what I'm saying is wrong. Or even better, like use the principles and explain why I'm even more right. Because that's always better. OK, so now I'm going to actually walk through the principles. I'm gonna do, OK, 15 minutes, that's fine. Uh, all right, so this is the whole list. This is also what is included on our nice little A5 that I'm going to keep plugging because we like them. And the nice thing about this is that everything fits on a page. And we, I mean, there's a ton packed in here. Everything on this page is we've thought about you know, way too much. But if you can keep all of this, then you've got the basis for it. You know, all of these are very complex topics that we kind of pack a lot into. And so maybe the nuances you know, will take a little bit longer to uh, kind of you know, wrap your brain around. But it, you can fit everything on a page. All right? And if you, you can just, you know, it's only seven. You can go through them in you know, 10 seconds. OK, so um, the first one and uh, a note about names. Because the funny thing is I've been given, like I said, this very end of a talk for a while. And most of the time, people aren't, you know, they don't give us any pushback on the concepts, but they give us a lot of pushback on names. You know, everyone likes to chime in. And so, yes, I did make up this word. And uh, no, I'm probably not going to change it. But uh, the reason why we chose some of the names, so this is comprehensivity as opposed to like comprehensiveness or some word like that. Uh, most of the time, if we chose a weird name, it's because the easy name has an association that we're trying to avoid. And uh, so we're, we're just like, you know, we'll just make up a new word for a new concept. That seems, you know, fair. So first one is comprehensivity. And uh, you'll see that all the principles are made of the same stuff. So we've got a sentence that is, uh, again, very uh, wordsmithed. Uh, we've got a key self-question, something you can just kind of ask yourself, and it's a good rhetorical cue. And then we give you a list of related concepts. So for the people who are like more tech savvy, you might be like, you know, what, you know, what falls under this category? Kind of help me frame it. And so for comprehensivity, the principle is identify and account for all relevant systems, actors, and risks in the environment. So um, that's, that's a little bit of a mouthful. Maybe, you know, you're, you're parsing it, but it doesn't totally scan. I think the key question is the easiest way to ingratiate yourself, which is just, am I covering all my bases? Right? Am I thinking about everything? Am I aware of everything that's going on? And so this is, we start with this one because it's kind of the first step of most security. It's like what most people think of as security. It's identifying vulnerabilities and then doing something about them. Right? So you're identifying and you're accounting. And so pretty much all of security is going to fall under this in some way. But we really focused on like the completeness part. You know, it's identifying account for all. So we got complete mediation. We got end-to-end -end encryption, and then we've got just some sort of like uh, you know information gathering stuff. You know, you do reconnaissance. You get an inventory. All right. So breaking it down a little bit more, there's the two big steps, right? There's identify, which is about building your awareness. It's about understanding what all's going on out there. And so some of that is understanding yourself. Like, what am I composed of? You know, like, I mean, for like the IT people, it's like, how many machines do I have here? What kind of machines am I managing? I got to know that stuff. That's like a, a standard first step. But it's also understanding your enemies and what's outside your gates. You know, what's going on outside? Who are my threats? You know, who are the people I got to worry about? And then the second step is account, which is basically the go do something about it now. Because, you know, if you just identify and you don't do anything about it, you're kind of dropping the ball. Um, we use a special, we use account here as opposed to like defend or something that sounds more, uh, I don't know, a little bit harder uh, because you don't actually have to do unique defenses for every single thing, right? There's a sort of, we want you to be aware of and we want you to take action in a sort of comprehensive strategy way. But the reason security is so hard is there's too much stuff to do and you're probably not going to do it all. You know, if you're doing it all, you're probably spending too much money, and that's something we're going to talk about later. So we want you to account for the risk. We don't want you to have just blind spots, but that doesn't mean that every single thing is going to be 100% you know, covered. OK, so I left in this example. This is the boring one, but it's just so, it's so straightforward. It's Achilles' heel. right? You got the guy, his whole body is invincible, but his mom dipped him into the river with, uh, by the ankle, and so his ankle, or his heel, is the only weak spot. And so the attackers hit him in the weak spot, and it knocks him out, right? His whole body's invincible, but he's got the one weak spot, and it, you know, he's done. So you know, attacker's going to prioritize your weak spot, so will you. 
All right, but the fun one, we're going to talk about Bowser. Um, so I just pulled up Bowser's castle, and it seems like he's doing all right, right? I mean, it's, it's a gigantic castle. He's got all the towers and you know, the, the holes for shooting arrows and whatnot. He's got a moat of lava, which is like a really nice touch, I think. Uh, he's got this single drawbridge. I'm just guessing it's retractable. Maybe it's not, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume it is because that's more fun. And uh, it doesn't look like there's going to be a whole lot of plumbing going into this. That's just my guess. And that's like a really good Mario-specific defense because he's good with pipes. So like, I think he's doing all right. He's kind of like he's looked at the environment. He said, OK, I got all these risks out there, but I've got a pretty good strategy. And I mean, there's obviously the one big entrance in the middle. But I mean, you got to use the castle. We're not just making the secure brick. So I think, all right, we'll give him plus one for Bowser. He's got comprehensivity, I think, pretty down. All right, so the second principle, opportunity. This is kind of like the mirror image of the first one. So the first one is like, oh man, I'm like on the defensive. I see all these people out there. I got all these risks. I got to like manage them. And opportunity says it's not all bad stuff out there. There's some good stuff out there too, and that can help you. So the principle is take advantage of the actor relationships, material resources, and strategic opportunities available in the environment. Again, a little word salad -y. That's because all these are buzzwords. But basically, I'm asking, am I taking advantage of my environment? Am I harnessing it for uh, my own, you know, my own strength? Strength. And you know, give you some related concepts here. Uh, so the three categories. This is what I really focus on because the process of it is similar to comprehensivity, where you just say, I'm kind of like I'm on the lookout and I'm going to seize on some of them, but probably not all of them. You know, not every opportunity is going to be a good one. So I focus more on, well, what are the types of opportunities? And we gave them the fancy names, but it's basically just stuff, people, and opportunities, again, because words are hard. Uh, so the first one is easy, just stuff. You know, there's, there's a lot of security stuff out there. There's vendors who are always trying to sell you stuff, and some of it's really good. I mean, I'm not going to poo-poo all the vendors. Uh, there's open source libraries out there. There's these organizations that give you tools. I mean, there's just like, there's a whole bunch of resources, you know, material resources that you can just take advantage of, and a lot of them are free. So um, there, there is a lot, and that makes it challenging. But it's out there, and it can help you. right? You don't have to do everything yourself. Same with number two, uh, people, you know, partnerships. Uh, there are other people out there, and not all of them are bad guys. And so there's like other organizations who have basically the same mission as you. Maybe they're similarly situated. And you can just ask them for help. You might say, uh, have you guys had this problem? Can you tell me how you managed it? Or maybe it's, we should team up and work together to try and solve this new problem. And then there's other, you know, there's things like law enforcement, there's researchers. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of people out there who are potentially on your side. And if you just kind of silo yourself off, you're, you're, you know, disregarding a huge potential opportunity. And then the third one is, uh, I didn't have a good word for this. I was going to use it like affordances, but most people don't even know what that means. The idea here is this is the most, you know, standard use of opportunity. You know, it's an opportunity. And so uh, there's something about the environment that you can like seize on. Uh, so I was like just at a conference last week, and uh, it was about resiliency, which is basically a, a new spin on cybersecurity. It's, it's all the same stuff, like I said at the beginning. Uh, but there was a whole track about deception. And it was saying, you know what? We realized we can't keep all the bad guys out. You know, we're, we're such a high priority target. It's too hard. There's just too many openings. So we're going to take a new strategy. We're going to let them in, but we're going to kind of cordon them off, and we're just going to watch them. We're going to see what they're doing, and uh, then we can kind of like we can gather more information than if we were just the sort of we were just you know secure perimeter organization. And so they're like we're using deception. We're making them think that they're inside of our of our you know systems when they're really not. And so that's an opportunity. Uh, the most extreme version of this is hackback. Some of you may have heard of, which is they hacked me. I'm going to hack them back and destroy the data or steal something from them. That's mostly illegal, so don't do that. But um, it, it, it helps elucidate the concept, right? Is that we're not just sitting there in our own little, uh, you know, in our silo. We're really taking action on the world. Okay, so Bowser. Uh, Bowser's doing pretty good on this one too, I think. So. I didn't have a great image of this, but Bowser loves deception. I learned that in like almost all of the games, you got to go through like seven other castles before you can actually get to Bowser, and everyone has like a decoy princess. You know, your princess is in another castle. Like, ah, you got us again, Bowser. He's so deception. I mean, deceptive. And then in other games, I guess there's like Bowser clones. You have to like defeat all the clones before you actually get to fight him. So he's trying stuff, and he loves his toys. Like this guy has never seen a new technology. He will not try. I mean, I know this is just a little like you know screen grab I pulled off, 
But, I mean, he's got ghosts, he's got fish, you know, football players. There's like, he's got the chompy thing, you know, the, the chain. So, I mean, he's, he's trying everything. I mean, it turns out none of them are that good, but God love him, he is trying. And also, I note here that uh, Mario also loves his toys. You know, he's putting on fire flowers, and he's got like the, the little uh, the feather that makes him fly. And uh, this is kind of how security works, you know. Defender takes an action. The, uh, the offense will then take a new action. So you're always kind of doing a cat and mouse thing. That's why we never really solve it, because it's kind of always moving. OK, rigor. Uh, rigor is the boring one, but it's still very important. So this is all about ensuring that the stuff that you plan to do actually happens, right? It's all about, you know, ensure would be the key word here. And so the principal language is specify and enforce the expected states, behaviors, and processes governing the relevant systems and actors. Uh, even the self-question is a little confusing, but I think most people intuitively get this. So what is correct behavior and how am I ensuring it? So the two key words here are specify and enforce. So those sound kind of uh, technical, they're very simple. Specify is literally just write it down, right? We're not leaving stuff to assumptions. We're saying, I want something to work this way, right? I'm writing a policy, or I'm, it's literally like a specification for a piece of technology. This is the way it should work. Right? It's all written down. And uh, this way we kind of, we get rid of the uh, hidden assumptions, which is something that is a cause of a lot of security problems, is just people assume something works one way. And hackers never assume that. They assume it's probably broken in some way, and that seems to work out better. And then step two is enforce it, which is just make sure that people actually do what you wrote down on the piece of paper. Uh, so that's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, you know, we know a thing here we call the policy development valley of death, which is basically people will write policies and then they go in like the pol policy cabinet and no one ever touches them, nothing ever happens with them, but you got them, you know, you got your policies. And that's not really that useful, right? You gotta train people on how to use them. You got to you know, do some enforcement. And then most important, I think, you got to iterate. Because the rule number one of policy is you're probably not going to get it right on the first try. And you got to learn. You got to, imp you got to um, improve it over time. So like you write an incident response plan. And then an incident happens. And you're using the plan. You're like, man, this thing isn't helpful at all. And so you go back and you change it you know, to make it a little bit better. And uh, so yeah, don't expect to get things right immediately. Uh, and then this is. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think I, I just like this book, The Checklist Manifesto, which is basically a problem with security is checklists, but it's not checklists per se. It's that there are good checklists and there are bad checklists. And this is an example of how checklists can be used well, and uh, sometimes they're not. But going on to Bowser, this one was uh, hard because video games kind of necessarily follow the rules, right? They're programmed. They kind of, you know, so we've got like Goombas, we've got the little turtley guys, and they just, they literally always do the exact same thing, right? If you're like a Goomba, you're just walking in one direction. If you hit something, you turn around. And those are the only rules. So, I mean, technically, that's pretty rigorous, right? They specified, you know, Goombas walk and do this. And uh, so, okay, they're doing all right. The problem is just that they're all really bad. Like, they're all just like the most simple, you know, we specified the most simple thing, and therefore Mario can always get around them, right? We got the big old blocks, they always come down at the same rate, no matter what. We never update it. And so, I'll give him like half a point on this, mostly because he's not iterating, right? He doesn't look, you know, level one, Mario goes in and just jumps over all my little guys, like, oh, I should like change that. So it's a little bit harder for him just to jump over them. And he never does that. So, half a point, right? Okay, minimization. This is, uh, this is like most of our team's favorite and also the one that no one does. So it, it's, all, it's pretty intuitive, right? Get less stuff, you know, can this be a smaller target? So we're gonna minimize the size, quantity, and complexity of what is to be protected and limit externally facing points of attack. Be smaller, be less complicated, make your job easier. Uh, and like I said, no one does this. The, the modern world is just exploding. We always want more stuff. Just plug it in, connect it, you know. It's a fridge, who cares? Give it internet access. It's, it, it's just the way of the world. And most of the time, we just deal with it, right? It was like, oh, we added more stuff. I guess I gotta secure that too. And one of the answers is no, you don't. You can tell them, get rid of it. You know, take it off the network. Or do some, you know, I mean, sometimes it's literally get rid of it. Sometimes it's, you know, limit the functionality. There's a whole lot of ways you can make things a little bit easier for yourself. So we list a whole bunch of things. You know, what are you minimizing? One, you know, physical size is, can just itself be a challenge. But really what we're getting at is complexity. That's the big one. 
you know, if something is big but simple, you can probably still secure it. And if something is small and complicated, you might need a whole team. Uh, quantities on here just for completeness. Uh, really, what, the one I, I want to get to is burdensome resources, which is something like if you're collecting social security numbers and you don't need to be collecting social security numbers, uh, don't. It, it's, it's very simple. You know, you know, so, uh, the problem that a lot of people have is that data has a lot of potential future value, and so people want to hoard it because maybe in the future it's going to be really valuable, and I don't want to like deprive myself. They're, like, they're thinking opportunity too much. And most of the time, you know, it's like, I, just, I don't need the numbers. I, I can get rid of it. That means I don't have to deal with the problems of securing it. I don't have to you know, pay you know, penalties if it, you know, they get breached. And then how do you actually do this? Um, you can just design it in from the start. You know, just make something simple to begin with. We always like to say security is easiest if you get in there early. Uh, but again, most of the world is already out there. Some of it is out there, and it's been out there for a long time. You know, we're dealing with you know, code written in the 90s or something like that. Uh, so step two, you, you can try pruning it. You know, maybe I can get in there, and I can just get rid of stuff that I don't need. You, know, you take the, you know, the hedge clippers. Uh, you know, uh, my colleague, uh, Susan Sons, loves to talk about how um, they, they went into a basically a really important piece of code for the internet that just had tons and tons of old crap. And they just started chopping it out. They just made it super simple, and they, like, like I forget what the number is, but it's like 80% of the vulnerabilities they just got rid of by just deleting code. You know, we didn't have to, we didn't have to fix them, we didn't have to secure them, we just got rid of it. And then also there's this, you know, just do it over time. Right? You're not gonna just like chop it all off in one big go. Okay, so Bowser. Uh, this is where he has a problem. Uh, as I say, this is Bowser's uh, glowing red weak point, so to speak. Um, everything he does is really complicated. It's like, uh, do I, yeah, I've got like 75 levels with 25 secret exits. There are like pipes just going every which way. I mean, again, you know, he has the opportunity love, but that means he's got a bajillion defenses, most of which aren't even that good, and he doesn't have the, you know, the resources to make them better. It's, he just can't manage the complexity of his security problem. So, I mean, this is probably where Bowser takes the biggest hit because he's just trying to do too much and it's all kind of bad. Whereas if he tried to focus on a much narrower problem, he might be able to do it you know, pretty well. Just imagine taking all those bad guys and just cramming them into like a quarter of the number of levels. Mario's got a much tougher time getting past that. Okay, compartmentation is the uh, confusing one. So this, uh, these are in the sort of architecture world, we like to say, which is about how you design systems. And uh, compartmentation is basically uh, what you do when, uh, when minimization fails. So I've got a, this big sprawling thing, and I can't just get rid of all the complexity. I've got to manage complexity. And compartmentation is how you manage it. And the reason this one's complicated is uh, it's got multiple steps, and it's not all, it's not, this is the least intuitive. So the three-step process is you isolate system elements and then enable and control the interactions essential for their intended purposes. And the key question, is this made of distinct parts with limited interactions? So that maybe didn't totally track with everyone, so I like to give uh, some examples. Uh, do I spell it out? No. All right, so the sort of the way I like to think about it is like you're, uh, you want to imprison someone, right? So I'm gonna build like a prison cell. The first thing you do is you want to isolate that person from the world. So you build like a concrete box. There's no way in, there's no way out. It's just a hollow box that, with a prisoner inside and you're like, cool, they're not getting out. Problem is no one's getting in. Like, not, like uh, uh, completely hollow box is not that useful. We, we're assuming like the concrete is indestructible and stuff like that. So all right, so that's the isolate step though. So I started off completely isolated. And then I say, what well, I need to do something with it. So I'm gonna start enabling a few functionalities. So I'm gonna say like, all right, well, I probably need a door, right? I, you know, we wanna get people in and out of it. You know, they need to, you know, we're not keeping them in there forever, obviously. And so we start enabling the functionalities, but we don't wanna just like enable them, you know, you know willy nilly. So we, we say, all right, what are the ones that we actually need? We need the door. Maybe we need like a window to make it kind of nice. We need like, you know, ventilation and plumbing and stuff like that. So we're gonna add them, but then we're gonna control them. So we've got like a door, we're gonna put a big lock on that door, right? So that way we can control how that door works. We're not just letting it be a door. Same with like the window. Maybe we make the window out of like indestructible glass, you know, something where you can see through it, but it's very narrow what can be done there. 
And uh, the, yeah, the idea here is that you can do this with almost everything. You just start, with a, start from a position of isolation, and then you start saying, what do I need, and what's the most narrow way I can enable that? And uh, the idea of control here, there's a lot of ways you can control. You can have like, you know, video cameras, so I'm watching what's going on. Uh, you know, th all of this has physical and logical components that I point out. It's easier in the physical world to uh, explain, but this, this works logically too, I think. Especially because in the logical world, a lot of times things start off isolated until you connect them, right? Things don't have an internet jack until you put one in there. Oh yeah, that's right. And the, uh, the other example, the reason why we chose compartmentation is because of the concept of ship compartmentation, you know, the watertight compartments. Uh, probably most famous on like the Titanic, where you say, we've got this big old ship. We don't want it so like one big hole can just sink the whole thing, because that would be really bad. So we want to make sure, we want to break it apart in a way that uh, prevents like one compromise from just spreading, you know, ad, ad libitum. And um, so we do that by we break the ship into distinct compartments. Like we're going to isolate all of these things, and then we enable them by putting the little doors. All right, so we get, people got to get in and out of the compartments, and so we got the doors with the big locks. But by doing this, we spread the, you know, we spread, we contain the spread of uh, bad actors. Okay, so. This is another one where uh, Bowser's not doing great. I, I have a video clip in here, but I'm kind of running low on time, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, first things first, his castles just collapse in a single go. Like anyone who's played the game knows what I'm talking about. You like press one button and just like it collapses to the ground, a little white flag pops out. I've got, I had all of them, all the, you know. He does them in interesting ways too. One, he just like mops it and it goes away. But that's not good compartmentation. Like you want that thing to like fall in segments. You know, it's like one tower goes down, but the rest of it's still standing. So that basically means if one part falls, the whole thing falls. Okay, the bigger strategy though. So we saw the map a couple of things back with like the 80 levels. And if you just follow the levels, it's, it actually takes a really long time to get there. And each one is you know, separate. So you beat the first level. You don't like half beat the second level. Like they're completely isolated. But it turns out there are a bunch of secret paths that make this, uh, not super, uh, his whole strategy is completely undermined by them. So there's just secret, like tunnels that you can just go through and just skip all the levels. There's just like this unnecessary connection between level one and like level 99 that you can just run through. And it's that kind of like unbridled uh, connectivity that causes a lot of problems to be much bigger than they necessarily need to be. Okay, fault tolerance. Uh, yeah, 10 minutes. So um, this one is much more intuitive, I think. It's, it's a little bit difficult to distinguish this one from the previous one. Compartmentation is about how you architecture things, and fault tolerance is really a strategy. It's have a backup plan, you know, short and simple. It, you know, rhetorically, it's the don't put all your eggs in one basket type thinking, but the basic question is what happens if this fails? So you go through all your stuff and you say, uh, you know, what happens if I'm giving this talk and uh, this like, screen fails? Like, how does that impact my mission? I can, still, I can keep talking, you just want to have slides. You know, if, same thing with the mic, if the mic goes out. But the point is to think about all those kinds of things. So language here is anticipate and address the potential compromise and failure of system elements and security controls. Uh, again, fancy speak, you know, we're anticipating and addressing, which just means plan for and do something about it, right? Very similar to comprehensivity. And then the potential compromise or failure of system elements and security controls, this is basically just your stuff. You know, so I've got these physical things, what happens if they break? I've got a strategy, what happens if that strategy fails? Okay, so um, this is a more like in, you know, uh, in the cyber uh, clubhouse thing. Uh, fault tolerance is not resilience, if people are familiar with the concept of resilience. Uh, we say resilience is a state. You wanna be resilient, whereas fault tolerance is a, it's a mindset or it's a strategy. You know, we, we plan for things. Um, it's how you get to resiliency. Um, Sure. Like I said, I was just at a conference where it was all about resiliency, and they're kind of like, well, resiliency is different than cybersecurity, and we're like, not really, not the way we think about it, at least. Okay, so how do you actually do this? There's, um, there's two big ways that I'd like to highlight. One is uh, top down, which is basically just think about the things you don't want to, you know, the really bad things you're worried about, and how you're going to deal with them. So I was just driving over here today from uh, Indiana. And uh, I noticed that there was like a storm seller like warning thing, like, do you have a plan for you know, when a storm hits? And I was like, that's, that's good fall tolerance. That's top down. It's like, I'm worried about tornadoes. I'm going to have a plan that deals with them. You know, I'm going to build the storm shelter. So you're thinking in a big picture approach. The other way I would think about this is like Netflix. 
Netflix really cares about streaming video being up. Like that's their main thing in life. And so they're thinking, how do we make sure that streaming video stays up? Right? That's the big failure they're concerned about. The other one is bottom up, which is basically just go piece by piece and you know, this is the, also a Netflix thing, but say, uh, what happens if this fails? What happens if that fails? And literally going through their entire organization and just breaking things and just say, what happens when I break this? It's like, does you know, breaking this one uh, search protector like turn the whole building off? That would be a really bad state. And so you just want to go through and check you know, what happens. Uh, that, the bottom up is more comprehensive. It's also a lot more time consuming. So normally you kind of want to balance the two. And then what do you actually do? So this is all about identifying the failures and then how do you, uh, you know, what are the things you can put in place? And I give you, this is just like a list of some options. So there's like redundancy, you know, you have a backup. So one thing fails, turn on the backup. Uh, survivability or like partial operability. So when things break, they don't break completely. Right? It runs at like half power. This is like a Star Trek kind of thing. You know, it's like, oh no, we turned, the shields are you know, only at 50% power, but they're still working. Um, you can just add more defenses if like, we really can't let this thing break, so just you know, put all the defenses there. There's also, you can just respond and recover more quickly. So it turns off, not great, but let's just get it back on and we'll get up and running again. Yeah, so those are some uh, good options. This was another one that was a little weird. I wasn't totally sure how to do this in the video game context, so um, I just went with how many hits it takes to actually beat uh, Bowser. So anyone who's played classic video games knows, most of the time you like jump on the bad guy's head, and you gotta do that a couple times, and then they die. That's how you win. So most bosses, it's like two or three. Bowser actually gets six. That's like a lot. He's got like intermission phases where he like throws cannonballs at you and stuff. There's like a whole lot of stuff going on. So I'm saying you're, he's actually doing pretty good. I mean, you know, six hits is not amazing, but not bad. And then I compare it to, uh, this is going back to like, you know, this is before even my time. This is a regular Nintendo, where literally if you hit this little ax right here, game over, right? You just win. He just falls and he's like, why does he have that one ax that just like means his instant demise? That's a clear fault tolerance failure, right? He should maybe, you know, just don't have that ax. I don't know why that's even there. Okay, and the last one, proportionality. This is most people's favorite, especially if you're not a security person, because this is don't do too much security, the principle. <laughs> um, so it says tailor your security strategies to the magnitude of the risks, accounting for the practical constraints imposed by the mission and the environment. Key question, is this worth it? All right. As I said from the start, cybersecurity is not for cybersecurity's sake. We're doing this to ensure some mission, right? Whether it's just I want my money, like my personal finances, or if you're, you know, you're like in the DOD and you're like, we want our missile to hit its target. You know, we've got a mission. And cybersecurity is just there to make it more sure that that mission is completed. But if you spend too many resources, you're probably going to undermine your mission, right? This is the classic, you don't spend $1,000 to secure $100. You just say, well, I'll just accept the risk. It's got to be better at, that point, at some point, right? So uh, the basics, again, yeah, security is always about the mission. And it needs to be in balance. So the point is, you can have too little security, which is something that I think we all kind of take for granted, but you can also have too much, right? If you're just throwing all your money at security, at a certain point, you're gonna get diminishing returns, and you're never gonna be perfectly secure, so you can probably accept a little bit more risk. So yeah, so it can mean more, can mean less, and you're not doing security for its own sake. So this is the other one where I'm like, I think this is Bowser's biggest failing, is that he is trying so hard to uh, capture the Princess Peach. I think it was actually Toadstool in this game, but most people know her as Princess Peach. And he, I guess he wants to conquer the Mushroom Kingdom. I think he should just give up. Like, he is throwing all of his resources at this, and he always fails. It's like, I, I mean, so this is almost like a, this is like a lesson about the world, is that sometimes a highly motivated adversary will just always get through. And if you were like, you know, uh, my threat profile is like the most basic attacker and then like the most advanced attacker, you might just have to say the most advanced attacker is getting through. Like I can't stop them. I'm just gonna have to deal with it. Maybe I'll like, I'll take other strategies. You know, I'll, I'll get insurance or something like that. But again, it's, it can be about doing too little, but it can be about doing too much. And I think Bowser is just doing too much. He's trying really hard and I don't think he's gonna ever beat Mario. So maybe he should do a little bit less security. And, oh yeah, and this is just a final thought. Uh, the way I think about proportionality is there's like four factors. So how big is the risk? Uh, how much is the security that you're getting? You know, it's like how much security value to mitigate against the risk? 
uh, how much does it cost, and then uh, are there any trade-offs? So you might say, all right, uh, it turns out that this security thing, it's pretty cheap and it's pretty effective, but every single one of my employees hates it. Like, it makes their lives miserable. It might be that those, like, those security trade-offs are enough to make it not worth doing that. That kind of stuff can be a little, uh, little squirrely, though, because a lot of times people just adjust to having to do like two-factor. Two-factor is not that bad. But it, like, the first time you have to do it, you're like, oh, man, it takes two steps. This is so hard. And uh, I think perfect timing. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Sure. Hi, th thanks for coming in, Scott. Um, of these principles, which one do you think most cybersecurity systems don't take into account, and why do you think that is? Yeah, so this is uh, definitely a minimization. I mentioned this uh, a little briefly when I was talking about it. And it's just that um, complexity is appealing. It's easy just to add more stuff and figure that someone else will deal with the pro consequences later. So um, it's just like kind of the way of the world that um, People, you know, functionality kind of wins out, and then security is kind of an afterthought for most people. So we always say, you know, you should do minimization, but people just don't. And it's, I mean, part of it is also that security people are normally not the people like making the decisions. We're like, you know, we're at the table, hopefully, and we're advocating. But if we're saying, you know, oh, adding this new, this new like business realm or you know whatever thing we're adding, it's going to add a lot of security. Problems and they'll, you know, the leadership will be like, yeah, but it's also like it's enabling our mission. Just deal with the problems, right? You know, do your job. I'm going to do mine. My job's making money. Your your job is dealing with the side effects. So yeah, probably minimization. Any other questions? I have uh, gifts to entice people, but I won't tell you what they are at first. They're probably not as exciting as you're hoping. But that's not a great way to sell it, is it? Sure. What kind of audiences do you give these presentations to out of curiosity? Is it um, financial firms, uh, educational institutions, sure. industry? Uh, so it's kind of all over the place. Um, mostly educational stuff. So I work at a university, so you know, I'll give it to other people within the university. Obviously, you know, most of our you know, immediate contacts are often other universities. Uh, another area that uh, we, we do this, um, we have an assessment process that we've built that um, it tries to incorporate the principles in a more fundamental way. And um, we uh, include uh, this, we, we make it more of a training. Excuse me. But so um, anytime we're doing an assessment, we will, uh, we'll include some presentation on this as well. And um, most of those are going to be like in, uh, like in, in the scientific community, something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could be anyone. It's just kind of people who ask. And, and we're not like evangelizing. You know, I'm not like going around giving this all the time. But it's a little canned speech that we sometimes do. Oh, and I, I promised a gift. which is just more reading on the principles, hey. <laughs> We've got a question over here. Oh, sure. So one of the problems that, the that we often have with, with cybersecurity is where do you start? Um, and principles are great to think about at, at a global level, but how do, you, how do you see this being used? I mean, do you see it as a combination with like CIS controls? Do you see, like... How do you see people taking this into, into action? That's a really good question. And uh, the answer, this is the, me being, bringing up my inner lawyer, is it always depends. That's the answer to every question is it depends. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to secure. So um, like let's say we're talking about an organization. You know, you're like a, like a startup firm. Uh, this is good for like making specific decisions, but maybe it's not like the best, you know, like you, again, you need that place to start. And there are frameworks that do have places to start. So like CIS controls, it's, it's a good control set. I um, mean, one of the things just to, to tout some uh, trusted CI stuff that we've been working on, we call it the trusted CI framework. But it's basically like, what are the requirements for making a security program? And it gives you just very simple things. Like, you know, you got to have a budget. You got to have someone in charge. You got to have governance. And so that would give you like sort of the place to start. You know, you find one of these frameworks that really just lays out the whole thing for you. 
And uh, from there, mostly, I mean, the way we envision the principles being used is mostly on a very specific problem basis. So like I am, like, uh, like the actual story was, um, we were doing an assessment. This is not we, this was a, before my time. I was brought onto the project after this motivation. But we were doing uh, security uh, for uh, a telescope. And normally, like I said at the beginning, the decision making process is, well, is there an answer to this question? Like, how do I secure a telescope? And it turns out, not really. You know, there aren't that many people doing security for telescopes. And so uh, we said, well, you know, we'll we fall back on first principles. You know, like, how do we deal with these problems? And so you use them, and you can really just walk through the principles in a pretty straightforward way. You say, all right, I've got a problem. I don't even know where to start. I got to secure this thing. Step one, let me think about comprehensivity. Like, what are all the risks I'm dealing with, and how am I dealing with them? So, you know, it's like, CIS control one, I think, is just inventory, which is basically know all your stuff. You know, it's comprehensivity. It's a, it's a different way of approaching it, but the principle's still there. And then you can just go through all of them. You know, you can do it pretty quickly. I, I do this intuitively now. Like, you know, I gave it, I did it for Mario, which is, you know, obviously not the, uh, the intended source. Did I just, I guess I don't need my slides. But that's the, that's the primary way that we imagined it. So when you look at all of, you, you have all of these principles, like, do you think they're all equivalently the same like when it comes to priority, or do you think certain principles take precedence or they're at a higher priority than others? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, the answer is always it depends, of course. So we actually, we have this idea that we've been, we've been toying with, we haven't formalized it yet, but of basically we call it a principle strategy, which is, as a baseline, we like to think all of these are kind of of equal value, right? You shouldn't just completely ignore any of them. You should, you know, people will be doing too much of one and they should really balance it out. But sometimes you'll find that some principles are just really hard for you and trying to do them doesn't make sense. And so instead you double down on other ones. So the classic example is you are like this gigantic organization with like, it's super complicated. You can't do comprehensivity well, right? It is just too hard. There's too much stuff going on. And so you say, all right, I'm not gonna focus as much on just trying to cover you know, all the gaps. And instead, I'm gonna focus on uh, compartmenting stuff so that one failure doesn't affect the whole system. And uh, you'll probably also do like some fault tolerance as well, you know, make sure that you know, one thing failing doesn't have catastrophic consequences. But in that context, you're basically saying, I'm, de I'm intentionally deprioritizing one principle and over-prioritizing other ones because I think that makes sense for what I need. And we think that's fine. The point is just to be cognizant that you're doing that. So um, as a baseline, we say, you know, consider all of these, give them kind of equal weight, and then make you know, informed decisions, right? We're not gonna tell you how to do your job. This is just you know, a tool to help you do it a little better. Okay, oh wait, we got one in the back. Last question is, which one will be the principle that will help you the most to secure money to actually get to do all this stuff? Oh, it's like, what is the best way to like motivate the people with the money? Right. Well, like, where in, in the seven steps would you start talking about like, hey, when you're trying to convince your leadership, like this is important. Like, where in those steps is it every single one, or is there one that you should kind of really pitch it in and hey, this is where we do it or or not? Yeah. So um, I, I would normally most of the time you start with proportionality. That's that's a good place. Cause that's kind of like the leadership speak, which is you know. Oh, you know, we're not doing nearly enough and there's a big risk. And so it, it, it thinks on their level. So that's a good place to start. Um, another, another factor that should go into this is the it depends part is, uh, has a lot to do with like organizational culture. And uh, you'll have different organizations where they're really worried about like reputation more than even like money per se. Like, you know, our reputations are the most important thing. We don't want to have a breach. And so you can go in there and be like, yeah, we, we got a gap, you know, we got a comprehensivity problem. There's a big old breach right there someone could take advantage of it, and they'll be like, okay, we're gonna deal with that. That's a big motivator for us. You have other ones which is like, I think in like more of the DOD space where uh, compartmentation is a big deal for them. They call it compartmentalization. That's why we chose a slightly different word. But basically it's, you know, we've got a whole lot of valuable stuff and it's so big, like we wanna make sure that like we don't have systemic risk from any one thing, you know, things are like cordoned off. They, they literally have like, you know, special access groups where only like 10 people know the information because we don't want those, we don't want a vulnerability to spread. 
And uh, so depending on the, I mean, there's probably some like tech startups that are like, they want the opportunity talk. They want like the new toys, something like that. And so it really just depends on what kind of organization you're dealing with. Oh, and yeah, final links. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, again, we have um, a bunch of these just up on the podium. They're a little A5s. They also have the contact information on the back. We got a website you can go to where you can find the A5 again. We also, we wrote a white paper. We wrote a little blue book. I actually owe oh, the guy in the back another blue book, which is, uh, it's basically, you know, more detailed version of that one pager. And uh, yeah, and there's a link to the, uh, the O'Reilly link where we actually published the book. Uh, so if there are no other questions, uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>